Timber Talks is brought to you by Wood Solutions. Stay up to date with the latest in timber, the building material that is strong, safe and sustainable. Here is your host, Adam Jones. Greg Nolan is an Associate Professor at the University of Tasmania's Discipline of Architecture and the Design Director of the University Centre for Sustainable Architecture with Wood. So Greg Nolan has been involved with research and development aimed at improving the use of wood and timber products in sustainable buildings and recovery of wood products from the available resource. So in today's episode, we have a real masterclass on the material characteristics of timber products, designing for durability, and the conceptual design process for timber buildings. So everything we talk about today is from Wood Solutions Technical Guide number 46. So if you want to find out more, I suggest that you read the full guide. Otherwise, let's get into the episode. And without any further ado, here is the interview with Greg Nolan. What are some of the most important points in regards to material basics for timber products that are important for designers? The place I like to start for people to understand is is that um, timber and wood products are intrinsically different to all of the other major building materials that we use. And I think the understanding that intrinsic difference is really quite critical for when, as designers, we then realize all the things we've got to look at when we're dealing with wood. So if we look at most all the materials that we would use in buildings, such as glass, aluminium, steel, concrete, all of those materials are man-made products. So we have, and usually they're the products of very large pieces of capital intensive equipment, and we have to apply lots of energy into the process to, to transform something like an ore or sand or, um, or other materials into the final material we want. So if we want to make steel, we can design the process to give us steels of different quality. And we can actually engineer the, the, that material then to do particular jobs. Um, and that makes them very useful and it also makes them quite predictable so the you know one bit is just like another bit and it's steel and it's all steel or it's all concrete you know so so we we, there's a lot of similarity between those those things um and they're similar between place to place you know so steel in steel in europe and concrete in europe is the same as steel and concrete in, in australia when we deal in wood we're not dealing with a material that's been transformed we're dealing with a material which the tree has grown for its own purposes. So the tree, though, is a result of millions of years of evolution in the genetics of the tree, and the tree has grown for its purposes. So when we take a wood product, we don't transform the wood. We basically reduce it from the log into a form that then is useful for us. So the characteristics of the material have not been generally engineered we're using what the tree has done and that's important for us in two ways one is it's it's a very low energy process compared to all the others which are very high energy processes but also then is that the wood is what controls the characteristics and not the engineering not the production processing control so while with many products, we try and grade things to get re- consistent, really structurally regular materials, and we can we can do that quite quite well. Is that under the, in the back of it though, we're always working with what the trees produced and the characteristics of what the tree wanted. And so, when we look at wood and we can see that it's anisotropic, that means it's got properties that vary in the different directions. That's because that's what the tree wants. I mean, and when we compare that to other materials, we don't necessarily have that same um, those characteristics. So with wood, we've got to re- we've got to allow then that we're dealing with this natural material. So once you start there, you can then say that well, trees are variable, just like you know people. The, you know, people are all from the same genetic pool, but we're all quite different. Well, trees are all quite different. They all come in different species. They've all grown in different conditions. They come out, they're harvested at different ages. So that means the wood in them is different. So it's variable. And 
there's very many things that affect the characteristics of the wood itself. And when we process it, and try and convert it into um, wood products that we can use, we then have to grade it into various forms, it, grade it in various ways so that we get pools of material that are more consistent for us to use. But at the, at the back of it all, we know that there's this variable stream of material coming out. So it's anisotropic and it's also hygroscopic. So what hygroscopic means is that it will absorb and give out moisture to be in equilibrium with its surrounding atmosphere. So if you take a piece of wood straight out of the tree, it, it has a lot of moisture in it. And then if you dry it in an industrial process where you're, you're drying it in a, in a considered and balanced and, um, way, you then get a product which has a moisture content that is the amount of moisture in the wood that is generally suitable for most applications. But as moisture will move in and out with changes in the surrounding atmosphere, like changes in climate or changes in the weather, then the wood will change dimension. So it will get slightly bigger or slightly smaller. And we all know this happens because if you've ever been in a house with wooden windows and you get a long period of rain, then the windows will start to stick. And after, if you have a long dry period, the windows will start to rattle. They'll, they'll, they'll all get a little a bit smaller in the frame so they're the consequences of it if you've got a large area of floor like a 20 meter wide uh, of timber floorboards then even though the individual expansion or contraction of of boards may actually be quite small when you add it up over such a long distance you can end up with quite a significant increase in dimension so these sorts of changes become important at particular times with particular application types. And so you've got to be careful about them, though you, you don't want to let it scare you too much. Um, if you get the basic principles right, then um, you can get a really successful solution. The other thing about working with a natural material is that lots of other organisms have evolved to um, use that material through decay and to eat it. So with, with wood, if wood is left outside, um, it is then vulnerable to a whole range of um, biological, forms of biological breakdown. And that's also then something that you've got to in, um, recognise in any building design. So if we... If we unpack that a little bit, there are a couple of key methods of biological breakdown. There's two quite critical ones, and then there's a couple that are, are important to us for aesthetic purposes or appearance purposes. So it's, it, it might make it unfashionable or unserviceable for us, but it's not actually going to lead to us having to replace it. So if we go to the two that then are quite critical, the first one is insects. So there are a whole range of insects that have evolved to enjoy eating the wood that is that, that we want to use in our structures. The most critical one of those, of course, is termites. And in most of Australia, termites are, are quite an issue. So there's lots of different processes, lots of different ways then of managing termite risk, which I think are, are far too extensive to go into here. But we've got to make sure that we manage, manage it exposure to termites. That's probably number one. The second one is um, decay. Decay occurs with wood that is wet and stays wet for a reasonable period of time. So decay is caused by fungi and the fungi will break down the wood because it's their food. There's fungi spores in the air all around us. So if the wood is moist enough so it's wet enough um, for the fungi to grow on it, then it will grow on it and it will, it will start to, to, to multiply. If the, dry, if the wood is dry um, or was, was wet and has dried out, the fungi can't grow anymore. So there are certain bench lines, barrier lines, for when the, when the material is too dry for fungi. But effectively, if you can keep wood outside 
and drying, it won't decay. Um, so even relatively low durability material, if kept dry outside um, or is allowed to dry out very quickly after it gets wet, it will still last for a very long time. The problem comes is that in many situations in a building, there'll be spots where the water will get in or can get in and the water can't get out again. So that area will stay damp. And if an area of wood will stay damp, then it will start to decay. And that's actually a design issue. So if we design it to be dry and have res you know, quite um, decay-resistant wood in those locations where things are likely to get wet and then dry out, then we'll get a structure that will last a hell of a long time. If we don't detail it properly, we can take some very high quality, useful material, and by bad design, we can give it a very short life. So I think that's one thing then that people need to, two things that people need to address. One is insects and the other is fungi. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the solutions? You meant, mentioned waterproofing, but also about the natural durability of wood and also perhaps the treating timber to, uh, to make it more durable. Because we're dealing with this natural material, um, some trees have actually evolved to resist termites because termites want to eat the living tree as much as they want to eat the dead one. And so the tree, of course, doesn't want to be eaten. So it's evolved um, part, you know, character chemicals that it, it puts into the wood to um, keep termites out. So that sort of material then has a relatively high natural durability. So you can put it outside for a long time or you can expose it to termites and it will resist both the decay and the termites. The next thing you can do is you can make the wood unpalatable to the, to the termites or to the, the fungi because remember the wood is food. Now, by putting a, a preservative into the, into the wood, you're making it unpalatable to the to the insects and or to the fungi, which means that they can't grow on it, or they can't eat it, or they don't want to eat it. So that way, then you can take material that would otherwise be susceptible to um, decay or, or or termites, and it becomes then quite resistant. So we've spoken a bit about the material characteristics of wood and timber. Moving on to uh, designing systems can you talk a, a little bit about the key uh, key considerations that are required for the conceptual design of timber buildings if we look now at how we want to design a design a building there's a range of things we then have to consider so all buildings have what we'd call performance requirements um, a key performance requirement of course is that the building stands up doesn't fall down so that's a structural requirement. Um, there are a whole range of other performance requirements we also then have in buildings. We have things like um, a visual appeal, visual appeal, so there's architectural requirements. There's things like acoustic requirements. There's thermal performance requirements. There's resistance to fire. So all these, all these performance requirements are critical. Okay, so... All of these different performance requirements have to be considered in the design of a building. Some of these performance requirements are regulated. So there's ones that we've got to comply with and they're set out, the requirements for those are set out in the building regulations, um, which is the National Construction Code. Some of them are not um, regulated or the performance that the client wants in the building might actually be more than the regulated performance because the building regulations only set the minimum basic requirement. They don't set what the market may actually want. So things like acoustic performance or thermal performance have a requirement in the, the building code, but a client may actually want more. So when a designer is approaching where to start and the various things they've got to consider, then they've got to actually work through the sets of performance requirements they're trying to apply in the building and set, well, okay, well, 
with this one, we're only going to cover the basic regulatory minimums. With these other ones, we may actually go above the regulatory minimum and target particular levels of, say, thermal performance or acoustic separation or fire resistance, which is over and above what the, what the regulations ask for. So when you've actually got then your list of, of performance requirements, you mix them together and you start to form solutions. Now, generally, the, the two um, sets of performance requirements that um, will drive initial design is the architectural concept um, and the art generally developed by the architects in conversation with the engineers, which is how do we want this thing to look? How big should it be? What type of opening scales, etc., do we do we want? Because um, obviously, if we're dealing with an apartment block um, where you've got relatively small rooms, you've got a different set of, of structural drivers than if you've got a large factory building or you've got an open open plan office building. So each of those things will have then different requirements. So the architectural drivers of the, the type of form and the functions of the building will then team up with the structural structural options you've got for achieving those particular um, requirements, those architectural requirements, and those sorts of things will start your initial frame of, of, a, of a concept design. As you get past the initial ideas, then the secondary performance requirements start to cut in. Um, from a regular, regulatory point of view, your first major one then is fire resistance. What levels of fire separation do you need between one part of your building and another part of your building? Or what level of fire resistance particular structural components need to have? So that does this column need to actually stand up for 90 minutes in a fire? That's fire is important um, and quite critical. What the next one is actually can be acoustic performance. Now, the, the National Construction Code only has applies performance requirements for acoustics to several classes of buildings, mainly apartment buildings, and almost none to anything else. Of course, though, is that the market will set different performance requirements that the National Construction Code isn't necessarily interested in. While the National Construction Code sets rules for so acoustic separation between apartments, in an office building, obviously, the customers in one floor don't want to hear what the customers on the upper floor are doing. The person who owns or is commissioning the building, they will then set how much acoustic separation they need between one level and another so that the, the, the um, office building provides satisfactory performance for the clients and the users. And that will be over and above what the National Construction Code requires because it doesn't set any acoustic separation for the um, for office buildings or for factories. So once you you frame these ideas together, you you uh, with particularly with something like fire separation, there's really only two major methods of satisfying um, performance requirements for fire with timber. One is is that you you protect it with um, fire-resistant sheeting or, or coverings, such as plasterboard um, or fibre cement. The other is, is that you provide what's called sacrificial layers of wood or thicknesses of wood so that the timber can char. Um, that means the, the timber burns on the outside, but you still have sufficient structural section in the element to continue to do the structural job that you want um, for the period of the, the for the design fire period, so they're your two major methods. The other key thing then with fire is that often it's not the wood that's the problem; it's of it's often the steel connector, and the steel connector can be often be the weak point in um, any timber design, any the fire resistance of any timber design. To give you an example. Um, the, the timber in a in a big nail plate truss can actually the sections can actually be quite large and, and in themselves have have uh, quite a lot of fire resistance. However, the nail pl the nail plates used to hold it together have, are very very poor, 
um, have very very poor fire resistance. So you actually got to you've actually got to design these things so you're protecting the nail plates. The same way with bolts, you've got to protect the bolt because the bolt will get hot, it will transfer that heat along its length, and the bolt will lose its strength. And then the timber comes apart because the bolt's not there to hold it anymore. So if you've actually got to protect steel, the best way to protect the steel is actually to cover it with some wood. And if you want exposed wood structures, then a lot of the, the connectors are actually protected by, by a sacrificial wood layer because it keeps the steel connector cool. And it will then protect the, the steel for the period, for the design period of the fire. Thanks, Greg. Is there any information you would like to leave us with about the guide or some of the questions that might be answered for the, those listening? All right, so the key thing about, the key thing then in when you, you can download the guide from the Wood Solutions website. It's free. Um, and readily available. When you look through the guide, um, it's not a book that you're going to start at the beginning and then move all the way through to the end and and use in a sequential manner. It's a guide pre- pre- presented and prepared so that you can jump around. So you might want to look at the concepts of uh, structural types at the beginning and then jump to the back where there's a lot of information about the particular product types and the standards. And then you might jump back again to look at ways in which you can prefabricate or examples of jointing details. So conceptual design, the initial stages of design, has a lot of processes in it. Sorry. Conceptual design, good conceptual design, should mean, mean that the designer is developing a solution, they're developing it reasonably quickly, they're getting some reasonable level of accuracy in their solution, but then they're presenting other solutions and developing other solutions which they can then compare against the first one or they can compare against each other. And it's the, the ease of being able to prepare that solution that allows you then to develop a better design um, as you move through. Now, this is the same for both architecture and engineering. So the guide is designed to allow you to make a lot of relatively valid decisions relatively quickly early in the piece. And then as the the overall solution becomes more refined, you can then go into more and more detail. As you get into the detail, then this particular guide then starts to use its immediate lose its immediate usefulness and it refers then to other guides which give you a much more detailed um, information about performance. So the guide for wood construction systems is not the, the thing that you really want to refer to when you're doing detailed design for durability. There is a durability design guide and you should go to that. So the, the guide for wood construction systems will get you to a certain level and then says, now it's time to go over there. So with the, with the guide as an overall, it's there for, to help with conceptual um, design and to build confidence in architects and engineers that they can actually come up with one of a whole range of different solutions and confidently move to the stages where they can price things, present them to clients, and also then discuss them with industry and and suppliers in a sensible and um, professional manner. So if you want to learn more about Timber Yourself, I suggest that you go to the Wood Solutions website. There are over 47 technical design guides there right now. And of course, you will find Greg Nolan's guide number 46 with all the information from from this episode and a whole lot more.